TaskRabbit was founded, how I came up with the idea. It was a cold winter night. This is February of 2008. I was living in Boston at the time. I remember it was February because it was snowing outside. My husband and I were getting ready to go out to dinner when we realized we were out of dog food. And at the time, we had this 100-pound yellow lab named Kobe, who we kept very well fed. We had called a cab to come pick us up and take us across town to go to dinner. And we were thinking, you know what? What if all the stores are closed by the time we get home? We're out of dog food. Kobe's got to eat tonight. What are we going to do? This is such a simple problem. Why isn't there a simple solution? And so we started brainstorming. And we thought, you know what? Wouldn't it be nice if there was just a place where we could go, say we needed dog food, name the price we were willing to pay. We were certain that there was someone in our own neighborhood that would be willing to help us out. Maybe even someone at the store at that very second, and it was just a matter of connecting with them. Why didn't that exist yet? And so even before the cab came to pick us up that night, I grabbed my iPhone, and I said, OK, if such a site existed, what would it be called? And at the time, I typed in the domain name runmyerrand.com, and it was available. And domain names are never available, so I bought it on the spot. And uh, for the next 18 months, we existed under that name, Run My Errand. I hated it about 20 minutes later and realized we would need to change the name at some point. But it got us pretty far. And um, so four months after that, that cold winter night in February, I quit my job at IBM, and I built the first version of the TaskRabbit site and got it launched in Boston. So when I was asked to speak here today, they asked me to share my philosophy on how I make ideas happen. And I thought about this, and I thought about TaskRabbit, and I realized that, for me, ideas are not inventions. TaskRabbit was a discovery. I hit a pain point in my own real life, and I thought about a way I could find a solution towards it. I wasn't the first to come up with an idea like TaskRabbit. Uh, you don't know how many people come up to me and say, I had the same exact idea years ago. I'm so glad that someone you know, finally built it. And that's the key. There's a difference between having an idea and the actual discovery around the execution and the operations of actually building that idea and bringing it to market. So today, I'm going to share with you the five most important lessons that I've learned along my journey for the course of the almost last five years. Uh, time has flown. And um, I'm excited to share them with you today. Let's jump right in. So the first lesson learned is to tell everyone you meet about your idea. Now, this might seem counterintuitive. How many times have you been out at a networking event or a party, and you meet another entrepreneur, another founder, and they say, you know what? I've got this huge idea. It is going to change the world. But I'm in stealth mode right now, so I can't talk about it. <laughs> and you're like, OK, that's great. You know, what can you tell me? Oh, no, nothing. In stealth mode, but believe me, this is going to be huge. I've even had people say, you know, if you're willing to sign an NDA, I, I could tell you more about my idea. <laughs> uh, it's just silly. It's silly. The, the, the amount of risk involved in sharing your idea is so marginal compared to the reward of collaboration. To, to, to emphasize this point, let's take a look at some of the most revolutionary ideas this world has seen and how collaboration has actually brought them to life. So the theory of evolution, Charles Darwin invented this, right? Well, actually. Alfred Russell Wallace also was thinking about the same idea around the same time. It wasn't until Wallace actually started sharing his ideas publicly that it gave Darwin enough confidence to get in there and to actually create that theory of evolution and share his idea with the world. He respected Wallace's reviews so much, in fact, that he included Wallace in, all of his, uh, in, in some of his uh, publications as well. Um, and so this just shows that collaborating on such a huge idea like evolution uh, you know, wasn't, wasn't a single person's idea. It was really a collaboration. Another example, the alternating current, which actually is bringing electricity to this room right now. Nikola Tesla was not the only person 
to come up and discover the theory of alternating current. In fact, he is one of dozens of engineers and scientists and physicists that got together to discover this and make it happen and create it. Just last month, in fact, five people were recognized with the Queen Elizabeth Prize for the creation of the internet. So these huge revolutionary ideas that have changed our world, that have disrupted things in major ways, can all be attributed to dozens and dozens of people collaborating together. So I love this example, and this comes from George Bernard Shaw, who says, if I have an apple, and you have an apple, and we swap apples, we both still have one apple. But if you have an idea, and I have an idea, and we swap ideas, suddenly we have two ideas. Isn't that beautiful? So collaboration is so key in sharing your ideas and in actually making them into something that is an invention, that is discoverable. It also is really important in expanding your network and creating an orbit of people around you. And one of the key mentors uh, in, in my journey has been a man named Scott Griffith, who is the CEO of Zipcar. Now, as an example, Scott and I didn't know each other ahead of time, but he came on as my very first mentor and advisor right when I was leaving IBM. Actually, I met him before I left IBM, and he really encouraged me to take the leap. Not someone I knew ahead of time, but I was at a dinner one night talking to a friend of a friend of a friend. And of course, I was sharing this crazy idea I had about TaskRabbit. And they said, you know what? My friend Scott would really love this idea. You should just email him. And they gave me his email address. I had no idea he was the CEO of Zipcar. Now, ignorance is bliss, because I went home that night. It was like midnight on a Saturday. And I cold emailed Scott Griffith. And I said, I have this great idea. Your friend said that you, know, you might think that it's really interesting, would love to tell you more about it. And to his credit, he wrote back pretty quickly um, the next morning. And he said, why don't you come by my office? We can sit down. And you can tell me about it. Well, Scott and I hit it off over a 30-minute conversation. And he was a pivotal person in actually helping me raise money. He incubated myself and TaskRabbit out of the Zipcar office for the first year that we existed. And so I never would have met Scott unless I wasn't afraid to share this idea I had for TaskRabbit, even before a single line of code had been built. The next lesson learned builds on this. And it's about fostering an environment of mentorship and collaboration. So again, I never would have met Scott unless I was talking to everyone I, I, I could possibly talk to about the idea, not even people I knew. I mean, people on the bus, people on the subway, it didn't matter. And another person that I met along the way, and this was also from just networking, is Anne Mirico, who is the uh, co-founder of Floodgate Fund and led TaskRabbit's seed round of investment. Anne is incredibly disciplined, she's smart, she's talented, she motivates me, she inspires me to wake up every morning and push the company forward. Forbes recently named her as one of the most powerful women in, women in startups. And so I would encourage you to go out and find advisors, investors, partners like Scott and Anne. And you should do this organically. You should, you should network, you, you should talk to people. You should connect with people that are just as passionate about it, your idea as you are. Um, you know, don't force mentorship. Um, it'll just happen as long as you're talking to as many people as possible and you're able to connect with a wide, wide variety of folks. One uh, quick tip I learned is when I was networking with someone, at the end of the conversation, I would always ask, is there someone else you think I should meet? And that was a great way to sort of create this long chain of people that I could talk to. The other key thing is to surround, to surround yourself with a community that's supportive and passionate about what you're building. And for me, that really comes down to the team that I've built. So we're 60 people now in San Francisco. Beyond that, we have over 10,000 task rabbits across the country. All of these people, the employees, the team members, the task rabbits, they're all so passionate about what we're building. They all so much believe in the vision. And that's so motivating 
to surround yourself with people that get what you're doing and want to build this big vision just like you do is incredibly important. And so that collaboration becomes a huge and important part of the culture and of the brand. The third lesson learned is to have BHAGs, big, hairy, audacious goals. We have a huge vision for TaskRabbit. It is to revolutionize the way people work. But we have to take baby steps to get there. One example of that is how we actually launched TaskRabbit initially. We didn't launch nationwide. We didn't even launch in a specific city. I launched in the neighborhood I was living in at the time, which was Charlestown in the Boston area. And we went zip code by zip code by zip code. We listened to our customers. We perfected the model before we started rolling out to new neighborhoods. We spent 18 months in the city of Boston alone before we took TaskRabbit to the West Coast, to San Francisco. From there, we spent two years in just two cities to really understand the model before we had then expanded out to nine major cities across the country. I don't wake up every morning and think about how I'm going to revolutionize the way people work today. That's just too big of a goal. It's not on my to-do list. But I do have small, actionable steps every single day that I can focus on. And as a founder, one of the most important things that I can do is set myself up for the next lesson, which is to just ship it. I think so many times it's easy to get caught up in perfection. You want to put out the best product possible, and you want it to be perfect, and you might spend extra cycles and time and days and weeks getting it to where you think it is perfect. But what you really need to do is think about what is the smallest possible test that I can run for this idea, for this concept, for this theory, get it out there, and get customers using it. Because your customers are going to be the ones to tell you if it's really working or not, what parts of the product are working, what pieces are not, what needs to be fixed. And so getting, getting product out there as quickly as possible and listening to your customers is so important. At TaskRabbit, we push code every single day, if not multiple times per day. Any new big feature or release that we work on, we think about what is the smallest possible test we can run in the next couple of days to understand if this is a viable uh, direction or not. The last lesson learned, and for me it's the one I hope you walk away remembering, is that you really need to love what you do. I love building TaskRabbit. I live it. I breathe it. Startups are hard. They become part of your life. There's no work life. The lines are blurred. And if you don't really love what you do and aren't passionate about what you're doing, it's going to be even harder. And so for me, it's been important to find something that I'm so passionate about that it makes me laugh and it makes me cry. And some days I want to scream. But then other days you hear stories of the amazing impact you're having on people's lives. And you realize that, you know what? We are changing the world. All these little baby steps that we're taking on a daily basis are adding up to something huge. And so think about what you love to do and go after it. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks for sharing some of the wisdom. Um, I, know, I know you're busy. To, it's hard to sometimes, like, you know, in retrospect, just think about some of the forces that played a big role. Um, OK, so back to the day where you quit your job at IBM to start TaskRabbit. Uh, and there must have been, soon after, I'm imagining, some very scary moments. So maybe you could talk a little bit about it. Tell me, you know, how, how did you uh, really stay focused and also persevere through those scary moments? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, it's not something I often talk about. but. When I did leave IBM, um, I cashed out my pension. IBM had a pension at the time. And it gave us about six months of runway, where uh, I had to make something happen with the business. Otherwise, I was going to have to go back and get a salary and you know, get a real job. 
And so um, those times were hard. It actually took nine months for me to raise angel money. And this was in late 08, early 09, when it was really a tough fundraising environment. And so those last three months, uh, particularly in early 09, were just day by day. Like, we're not really sure what's going to happen. But I think, you know, deep down inside, again, I was so passionate about what I was building, and I really loved what I was doing, that I just knew I was going to persevere. Mm -hmm. I never... I never thought, like, oh, when I, how am I going to shut this down? How, how is this going to go if, if, if I fail? Like, it, I didn't let it even cross my mind, even though, you know, we were past that six-month mark. So I think it goes back to just being really passionate and loving what you're doing and focusing on that. It's interesting. And you know, earlier we had a speaker, uh, AJ Jacobs, who talked about the importance of self-delusion, you know, just telling oh, yourself, Absolutely. even if it makes no sense that you're the, you know, the one that's actually going to succeed when all the others fail, but just right. telling yourself that you are and how that... Well, and here's the thing about that. It's like no one knows your business like you do. You are the only one that is in it in, in a very unique and intense way. And so even mentors and advisors and people that can really guide you, they're not going to know. Mm -hmm. um, and there is this, I think, just innate insanity in entrepreneurs that just keeps us going and it, it, it there is a piece of self-delusion involved but again if you're just really passionate about what you're building I think I think that helps so how about lifestyle you know you're there's a lifestyle that you have when you're getting that paycheck at the end of every two weeks and the bonus at the end of the year and then you unplug from this and then lifestyle must change in some way uh, anything you you know do differently now looking back at how life suddenly changed when you unplugged and started something from scratch with cashing in your pension? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I think for me, um, there is a lot of just mental and social and family relationships that became really hard because the startup environment was so intense and we were so bootstrapped. Uh, I remember six months in, at sort of that six month mark was around the holiday season in 08. And I remember it's Christmas time, and you know my whole family's there, and they're all so happy and excited, and I'm like feeling like I'm being hurled off a cliff, you know. And so I think that initially that balance for me of just sort of normal family relationship life versus what's really happening in my head with a startup and how intense and how hard that was was really hard to reconcile. And I think looking back over time, I've learned how to kind of keep that balance better mm -hmm. and how to just mentally absorb everything. Um, but that was really hard at first. Um, how about, you know, it's always interesting when I meet uh, people with ideas and they just assume that there's a correlation between having a great idea and starting it and then actually having the skills to lead a team and a company. You know, we just assume that, oh, that will be the natural you know, progression of pushing this idea out that I'll be able to also lead this. Uh, but in fact, of course, we have to develop, build a whole new skill set in order to lead a team and build a team and lead a company. Uh, uh, what was the most difficult challenge for you in building that unique skill set you needed to now you, know, you have 60 employees to bring TaskRabbit to this level? Yeah, you know, at first, I wasn't really thinking about building this huge company. I was thinking, I have this great idea. This site should exist. Why doesn't it? I know I can build it. And that was really the, the mental state I was coming from. But then you realize, you know, you go out and you raise money and you start hiring and all of these other things happen and, and you, you definitely need to build skills around them. Uh, for me, it was really important to find those right mentors and advisors early on that could help be my sounding board, that could help guide me. Scott Griffith, again, was just so key. And particularly being able to work out of the Zipcar office for the first 12 months that we existed, I just really got to observe how he ran that office. Mm -hmm. And that had a big impact on me. Uh, so it was nice to be able to observe that. I feel very fortunate for that time. That's great. We have a little time, so I'm going to actually throw in a kind of a geeky question here. Okay. But what's the, um, what would you say is the number one feature on your site that you feel has built trust and reduced friction with the users of TaskRabbit? You know, um, the reputation engine we've built has been probably uh, the most impactful uh, thing for building trust between users, for reducing friction. Um, when I originally had the idea for TaskRabbit, it was a time where Facebook was 
just becoming popular out of the college scene. Twitter was sort of up and coming. Um, and I was thinking about ways that we could leverage the social graph to build trust in an offline environment. And so the reputation engine we built at TaskRabbit from the ground up really has a lot of social layers in it um, and features. So TaskRabbits can earn badges. They can level up on the site. They earn points. And as people choose who they want to work with, they have all of this extra data and all this extra context about who this person is mm -hmm. beyond just sort of a static profile and a picture. Um, and that has made a huge difference. I think. Adding more technology to bring a more human uh, experience online so that people feel better trusting each other offline is a trend that we're going to continue to see develop um, in a lot of different platforms and companies going forward. No, I agree. Um, you know, the last question, which is one of the ones we got from the poll of the community here, uh, keeping a team together obviously requires good chemistry and a great culture. Um, and uh, so when it comes to hiring people, what qualities do you look for uh, that you think will help the, the TaskRabbit culture be what you think it needs to be? Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm thinking about hiring for culture, it's always around uh, how passionate is this person about what we're doing? Do they understand the longer term vision? Um, do they understand we are, where we are today and all the different paths that we can use to get there? Um, so TaskRabbit definitely attracts a certain type of person. Um, the people that are at the TaskRabbit office today really have an affinity for community, for the idea of neighbors helping neighbors, for connecting people offline to get real things done in the real world. And all these amazing stories that we hear on a daily basis about how we're impacting people's lives really do affect every single person um, at the company today. So we kind of look for that DNA. Um, and people you know, that join TaskRabbit over and over again say that they're looking for something beyond just uh, you know, the normal nine to five or even uh, uh, another startup that they want to change the world. They want to make an impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's really important for culture. And I think beyond that hiring wise, I've learned that hiring in the early stages is very different than hiring in the later stages. And that was something that I had to kind of figure out as I went. Um, but early on, you're really just looking for people that are total athletes. They're like the Swiss Army knife, you know, of startups and can do a lot of different things. Um, Basically anyone that will work for you. At that yeah, point. yeah, exactly. Anyone <laughs> who will work really hard and um, will just figure things out and will go through walls for you, absolutely. And later stages, you know, you start to look to specialize in particular areas that you want to grow and scale and build out. Yeah. Um, well, listen, I, I really admire everything you guys do to empower people to work. And uh, it's a great site. Good luck. Thanks for joining us Thank here. You. Leah Busky, everyone. Thanks for having me.